Hey everyone, Pastor Brent here from Trinity Church in La Ponde. Just want to take a moment and welcome you to this week's online service. Before we jump into service, let me encourage you to head over to our church website, trcwapon.com, and underneath the media tab, you'll find what we refer to as discipleship questions. And what these are, they're two questions that are really uh, crafted to help you think through and then implement the scripture that we're going to be discussing during today's service. So if you haven't done so yet, or maybe you've never done so, head over to the church website under the media tab, grab those discipleship questions, and then uh, you'll be prepared to be able to jump in and really kind of think through today's message. With that, I'd like to invite you to join us for a time of worship, and we'll be back together in just a little bit to read God's Word. Grace be with you. Well, as we prepare our hearts to enter into a time of worship, I want to share some scripture from Isaiah 25, verse 1. And it says this, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. So as I'm reflecting on that verse and, and looking at the song that we're going to be singing today, 10,000 Reasons, it's just a reminder that, that we have so many things to be thankful for, so many ways that, that God has blessed us, so many ways that God uses us on a daily basis that, that we have reason to, to celebrate. We have reason to enter into this time of worship in awe and in honor of God. So as we sing this song, our prayer is that, that you will enter into a time of worship that is engaging in a way that you are able to connect with God, to hear what He is speaking to you today. And as we prepare our hearts for a time of hearing God's Word through the message, our prayer is that this, this will be a time of encountering God in a way that, that we can see how He is moving in our daily life. So please join us as we sing 10,000 Reasons.
Lord, I worship your holy name. Amen. Please join me in a time of prayer. Lord, we just thank you. We recognize that there are so many things that, that go unseen, so many things that, that you are doing in our lives that, that we just kind of pass over, and we don't always take the time to, to thank you for that. So our prayer is that, that you will help us to, to be mindful of the many ways that, that you are working in our lives and in the lives of those around us, and allow us the opportunity to, to really reflect and, and be grateful for the, the many blessings that you have given us. As we enter into the message and in a time of being challenged through the reading of Scripture, I pray that you help us to be mindful of the, the past sermons and the, the ideas and topics and discussions that we've been having, and ultimately that, that we come away knowing you on a deeper level and that we can feel your presence as we go throughout our daily life, that we can encounter you on a daily basis, and that ultimately we can, can not only know you on a deeper level, but share all that we are learning with those that, that may not even know you yet. So we thank you for that opportunity and our prayer is that, that as we continue to, to learn and, and study your word, that you will help us to, to just be mindful of that each and every single day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, if you happen to have a Bible nearby, let me invite you to open it up to the book of Matthew. And today we're going to be in chapter 6. Now, for those who are joining maybe for the first time, we are in the middle of a series here at Trinity Church in which we are discovering what it means to live a blessed life. Now, I think that we would all agree that we all desire to be blessed. But how often do we stop and ask the question, well, what does it mean to be blessed? Normally, we would respond, well, to be blessed means to have the things that make for a comfortable life. This could be certain luxuries, certain key positions, certain personal relationships like family and friends, right? Which obviously sound like the right answer. I mean, those are the things that we tend to point to in life and say, those are my blessings. Yet, interestingly, in what is Jesus's probably most well-known and extensive teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, Although he repeatedly referred to the blessed life or what it means to be blessed, he never mentions any of these comforts. Instead, what Jesus taught was that the blessed life is one that flows from following him. According to the Sermon on the Mount, true blessing is to have our life shaped by living in relationship with Jesus. And today, the Sermon on the Mount, it's going to show us how a life centered on Christ impacts how we relate to others, to God, and even ourselves. So again, if you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse number 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, Sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, before we begin unpacking this portion of text, you probably noticed that we skipped over a chunk, verses 9 through 15. 
Uh, those verses center on what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. And next week, we're going to dedicate our entire service to looking at and understanding what Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to do that next week. But for this week, we're going to do, uh, or what we're going to do is, is we're going to take a somewhat broader look at three relationships that we engage in daily that Jesus talks about here. Now, over the past several weeks, we've discovered in Matthew chapter 5, which is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, that really Matthew 5 centers on what we could call Christian character, the attitudes, the postures that Christians are to hold. So attitudes like humility and honesty, and faithfulness, peacefulness, those are just to name a few that we've discovered over the several weeks that we were in Matthew 5. Now, as we move into Matthew 6 today, we find really that Jesus begins to show us practical ways in which these attitudes or these characteristics are to manifest in the lives of his disciples. And the first three things we discover from Matthew 6 regarding how these attitudes really should manifest in our lives, Jesus says is through giving, through prayer, and through fasting. Now, the first thing that we're told about these three in, in verse 1 and 2 is that we're called to do them well in secret, which if you remember from Matthew 5, sounds like a bit of a contradiction. Remember Matthew 5, 16, Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and you give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now you can see where the contradiction comes into play. We have Jesus saying, do good works so others can see them. And then we have Jesus saying, do good works so no one can see them, right? It, it seems like there's a contradiction there. But Jesus clarifies this for us. Jesus clarifies in Matthew 6, and he says this, that some were engaging in what we would call uh, works of righteousness or pious works not for God's glory, but to get noticed by others. And Jesus uses this very strong word to describe them. And it's the word that we translate as hypocrite. Now, if you were to look this up in a Greek lexicon, what you would find is that the definition of this word literally means to be an actor. So what it seems that Jesus is saying here is that there were certain individuals who were pretending really to be something that they weren't. And they were pretending because they wanted others to think different of them than they actually were. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been around someone who you could tell was trying to impress other people? Right? I'm sure you have. We've all been in those situations where there's that person in the group who you can obviously tell is trying to impress others. They're pulling out all the big, heady, technical words. They're pointing out their achievements. Whenever someone tells a story, they always have to top that story. Yeah, yeah, but I, right? I mean, you almost wanna just get them a, a sweatshirt that has blinking lights on it that says, look at me, look at me, right? Here in Matthew 6, what Jesus is saying is, don't be that, don't be that person. Don't be that person with the shirt with the blinking lights. And Jesus even says this, that those who do, those who make it about themselves, those who make it about getting the attention of others, of being adored by others, that they should know this, that they'll have no reward with God. The Life Application Bible Commentary states, says that God rewards good deeds done for his glory alone. He does not reward good deeds done for recognition, display, applause, or honor. In fact, as Jesus explains in 6.5, the valued reward from others is the only reward that will be received. What Jesus is doing here is telling us that we have a choice. We can either choose to pursue the adoration of others or we can choose to pursue the exaltation of God. And Jesus says this, right? That both of them come with a reward. 
either we can have the reward of the approval of others, or we can have a reward that will last for all eternity with God. Now, I'm not going to speak for you, but, you know, for, for myself, an eternal reward sounds a lot better than one that only lasts for a moment. So Jesus, what he's doing is he's telling us here to pursue the eternal reward. And he tells us exactly what leads to eternal reward. And he says it's this, caring for the needs of others, cultivating a deeper relationship with God, and ruling over our sinful flesh. So for today, what we're going to do is we're going to look briefly at each one of these. The first one being caring for the needs of others. Now, you may not be aware of this, but scripture speaks of money and the things that money gets us, possessions, literally hundreds and hundreds of times. How we think about money and what we do with it is one of the most dominant themes in the Bible. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is this that it's really easy for money and the things that money gets us, so possessions, comfort, status, power, it's really easy for those things to become the pursuit of our life and really for money to become a false god in our life. So in order to break that, in order to prevent that, Jesus says this, that we're to live generously. That's why Jesus doesn't say if you give, but he says this, when you give. Scripture warns us again and again about the love of money. Now, I should say this, that the Bible never says that money in and of itself is bad. It's what we do with our money and how our money affects our hearts. Because again, money can take a unhealthy hold of us. But Jesus, Jesus tells us exactly how we can prevent that. And it's found just after the, the verses that we read early, earlier in Matthew 6, verse 21. And Jesus says this, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, we would think this. We would think that our treasure would follow our heart. Right? So that which we love, we invest our treasure, and money is one of those things. Yet Jesus says, actually, it's just the opposite. Remember, a world upside down. Jesus says this, that our heart follows our treasure, not necessarily that our treasure follows our heart. It's why people who choose to live generously love to give. And the more that they give, the more that they love to give, and the more that they look for opportunities to give. I mean, here's the reality. Hoarding develops a love in our hearts for things. And the more we hoard, the more our heart craves more. But giving, giving develops love for others. I heard the story of two gentlemen who met for lunch. They parked and then they were walking to a restaurant. And as they were walking there, they seen uh, an individual who was homeless and laying um, on the side of the road. One of the gentlemen took some money out of his wallet and walked over and handed it to the homeless person. And the other gentleman, as they began to walk back together, started to kind of ridicule him and say, why would you do that? You know, he's just gonna, he's just gonna waste it. He's probably just gonna get drunk or buy drugs, things of the sorts. And the gentleman who had given the money, he looked at his friend and he said, I didn't do it for him. I did it for me. I did it for me. You know, when we give, it softens our heart. It makes us more compassionate and it helps us to see others as God sees them. According to Jesus, 
when we give, not so others will praise us. Oh, look, look at that individual. Look how great they are. Not for that reason. But when we give because we want to honor God, he says this. He says that we will be rewarded. Now, that doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean that we will win the lotto. So don't, right? Don't tithe and then think God's going to make you win the lotto. That's not how it works. What it means is this. It means that we can trust God to care for us, both in this life and the life to come. Really, giving, it frees us. It frees us from the love of money. It frees us from the worry of not having enough. And it allows us to live even more generous than we ever thought we could. And Jesus promises us to reward us for that. Now, the second spiritual discipline that Jesus discusses with his disciples is prayer. Now, we're going to talk about this more extensively next week. But for now, what I want you to see is that the blessed life, really, it is marked by a growing relationship with Jesus. And ultimately, that's what prayer is about. Prayer is about relationship. Here in Matthew 6, Jesus speaking with his disciples, he, he shares with them how some, some act super religious. Maybe we could say it that way. They act super religious when it comes to praying in front of others because they want others to think of them as more than they are. But the reality is they don't really have a relationship with God. Out in the public, right? They sound good. They're, they're at the synagogue. They're on the street corner. They're praying. People are looking at them going, look how righteous and holy and religious that person is. But they don't really have a relationship with God. Their private life, their private prayer life doesn't match this public prayer life. He says, or there's, there's this other type of person who they think that they can somehow impress God with their prayers. They're going to say all these super religious things and that somehow is going to impress God. So we can see in both cases, it's, it's about trying to impress instead of having a relationship with God. Prayer isn't designed to impress other people or try to impress God. Prayer is about developing a deeper relationship with Jesus. And here's the reality. You and I will never have the relationship that God wants us to have with him without seeking him in prayer. The Life Application Bible Commentary states that prayer develops an intimate personal relationship with an abundantly loving God who also happens to know us deeply. Prayer develops the trust that says, Father, you know best. What prayer does is really it strengthens our relationship with God and it grows our faith. It matures our faith. And as we're going to see next week when we look at the Lord's Prayer, it's not about impressing others. And surely it's not about trying to impress God because we can't. What prayer is about, it's about growing deeper in our relationship with God. And that's exactly what God wants for you and he wants for me. Now, third, Jesus tells his disciples this, that they have to learn to rule over their flesh. And the example that he gives here is fasting. Now, fasting is probably the least favorite and therefore most often overlooked spiritual discipline uh, that we have. And what, this is what fasting is, if maybe you're not familiar with it. It is choosing to deny our bodies by giving up something our bodies desire for a certain period of time so that instead we can focus on strengthening our spirit. Now, there are different ways that people fast, but the most common and most often cited in scripture is a food fast or going without food for a period of time in order to focus on spiritual growth. Now, the most common fast that we see in scripture would be a 24-hour fast from all food. So in that, a person would still drink liquids or drink water because you don't want to become dehydrated, but they would choose to go without food for a period of time. 
most often, again, all food for 24 hours, but this can be modified for different reasons. Uh, maybe today if a person were fasting uh, and they had a medical condition that prevented them from fasting for 24 hours, they might choose to maybe only fast a meal or to maybe fast certain things. Maybe they would only eat fruits and vegetables and, and give up sweets and things of the sorts for a certain period of time. I always encourage people if they want to do a full 24 hour fast, to model it after the Jewish fast that's similar to what is found in the Old Testament. And this is what I mean by that. We, our days uh, go from midnight to midnight. Yet when we think of a day, we tend to think of them from the time that we get up in the morning until the time that we go to bed in the evening. So therefore, if we were to say we're going to fast a full day, we would fast the entire day that we're up from the time we get up till the time that we go to bed. But on both ends of those is sleep, right? So if you think about that, if you add the, the time that we're sleeping, really a fast then becomes more than 24 hours. It becomes more like 32 hours. But a Jewish day, a Jewish day goes from sundown to sundown. So think of it this way, from dinner to dinner, from that final meal to that final meal of the day. So a Jewish fast would be 24 full hours. A person would eat dinner at night and then choose not to eat again for 24 hours or until dinner the next day. And during this time, they're not just choosing not to eat, but what they're choosing to do is focus specifically on growing their spiritual life. They're, they're suppressing their flesh so their spirit can become more sensitive. So this would be done through prayer, through reading scripture, and through worshiping. And again, what happens is as we suppress the flesh, if we choose to say, flesh, this is what you desire, but I'm not going to give it to you. Instead, I'm going to seek after God. What happens is our spirit becomes more sensitive. We begin to hear God clearer, and we find that we have victory over sins that we battle in the flesh. So let me give you an example of that. For years, I was a smoker and I smoked one to two packs a day for years. And I tried everything to quit. I took the pills, I took, I used the patch, I tried cold turkey, you know, I, I tried other things like suck on a mint whenever you want a cigarette, things of the sorts. And I failed every single time. I just, I could not find victory over smoking. And that was until my wife and I fasted together. And we set a day, a 24 hour day, and we said, we are gonna fast and spend that time in prayer and seeking God for me to have victory over this addiction that I battled for years. And God was faithful. And I'm not going to say that I never craved a cigarette ever again, because I did. But it was the only thing that broke that addiction off of my life. If you find yourself and you are struggling to have victory over sin, if you're facing a big decision, if you're in a stressful season, if you need wisdom from God, then add fasting to your spiritual disciplines. Start with a meal. Eat only fruits and vegetables for a period of time, maybe three days a week, a month, or choose to do a full 24-hour fast. When you suppress the flesh's desires and you focus on spiritual disciplines, reading scripture, praying, worshiping, what happens is you will strengthen your spirit. You will find that you, your faith will mature. How you relate to yourself will change. In the opening verses of Matthew 6, Jesus reveals to his disciples really some, some practical ways that we can walk in the blessed life, especially in regards to key relationships that we have, relationships with others, a relationship with God, 
and then our relationship with ourself. Jesus taught this, that we are to care for others. We are to pursue him. And we're not to allow our flesh to dominate us. Giving, prayer, fasting, what they are, they're spiritual disciplines that will help us embrace this new life of following Jesus. So my prayer for you as we close today is that you will practice your righteousness for an audience of one. That you will seek to glorify God with how you live and that you will receive the eternal reward that he has for you. Let me pray for us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you have given us today to be together and to read your word, to worship and to pray. And we ask that as we have read from scripture, that your word would be like a seed that is implanted into our heart and that it would grow and it would bring transformation to our lives. As we've seen, you've called us to be people who give, people who pray, and people who fast. Help us to embrace this call to care for others, to seek a deeper relationship with you, and to not be dominated by our sinful flesh. Jesus, we confess that only you have the power to save. Forgive us of our sins and lead us in the paths that you've called us to walk down, that you've created us for. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we can live the true blessed life because Jesus, because of your death, burial, and your resurrection. Holy Spirit, make us sensitive to your leading. Help us to hear you more clearly. Grow our faith so that we can trust you more fully. Holy Spirit, teach us to be like Jesus. And may our righteousness not be practiced for our own exaltation, but for God the Father's. And we pray this all in the saving name of Jesus. Amen.